Hello, hello. Okay. Good. Okay, nice. Uh, okay, yeah, then you can just navigate back to wherever. Cool. Oh, have you tried plugging your thing in yet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Good stuff. guys i think uh, we'll make a start so thank you all for coming down uh, this is a lecture series workshop series on uh, time series analysis uh, my name is adam hussein i'm a third year physics student uh, and i'm the head of talent development here can everyone hear me at the back yeah cool okay so before we get started we've got a bit of setting up to do so there are a few ways we can access uh, the material for the workshop so you can either just type in the URL here, um, which will take you to the folder where you can either download it and run the code locally, or you can uh, run it on Google Collab online. So if you have your own IDE you prefer working with, obviously download it. If not, that's fine. So I'll give everyone a few few minutes. Imperial WPA, I mean, you can log in with your Imperial app. So just for those who just for those who are just arriving now, <clears throat> yeah, for those who are just arriving now, I'll give you a few minutes just to um, get the material uh, downloaded, or you can view it in Google Collab. Uh, and I'll get a show of hands in a few minutes. <coughs>
uh, just while we're waiting, can I just get a show of hands who's familiar with uh, Python? Is anyone not familiar with Python? Apart from these two. OK, and is everyone familiar with uh, using Pandas? Is anyone not familiar with using Pandas? OK, that's fine. I'll just do um, so this is not really a how to use Pandas course, but I'll include some explainers as we go along. Uh, Pandas basically has a lot of built in functionality for time series. Um, so it does a lot of stuff under the hood for you. So that's why we use it. Kind of use. <laughs> Okay, for those who've just arrived, uh, I'm going to get going, but uh, everything you need, Jen is going to post in the WhatsApp channel uh, in terms of accessing the material for this uh, lecture. So to start, uh, what are time series and why learn about them? Why bother? So first of all, a definition, time series is basically just a data set uh, of a single variable as a function of time, and we assume that the sampling rate is constant throughout. Uh, meaning, so, you know, once every second, once every day, once every year. Um, and why study? Well, it gives us sort of a, a greater amount of predictive power uh, over phenomena which are not necessarily well described by a set of mathematical or physical laws. Um, and it's a very useful uh, subject to know about and has applications in finance, retail and economics and more. <clears throat> so first thing we, uh, we're going to do is load in our data uh, using Pandas. So I will just swipe over to the notebook and does that work? Am I able to, Jan, am I able to switch over to the notebook? Can I get a bit of technical assistance? I need to click this here. No, it's not to do with Microsoft Teams. Oh, as in when you. I don't know what I can do. I can end the slideshow and then switch over. Oh, yeah, this is what I usually do as well. Yeah. Okay, fine. Cool. <clears throat> okay, so uh, first thing we're going to do is just load in the data that we're going to be working with. And now this is uh, production of electricity, the monthly production of electricity in the US from. 1985 up to 2018. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the units for this, but that's not uh, completely relevant here, but we can go and look it up if we want. So first of all, have we all, have we all got the notebook in front of us now? Is anyone still trying to get that sorted? If so, then one of our guys can come around and help you. So just uh, give me a shout. So first of all, we, we're going to read in our data. As we can see here, I'll just clear the cell outputs. And so we should be able to see uh, 397 rows and two columns. So that is 397 months worth of data. Uh, and now what you can see here is that the column names, uh, well, we've got dates, that's pretty self-explanatory, but we've got this thing here, which often comes up when you are when you're using data from a large database where they've got their own kind of naming system for the columns. Um, but we don't want that here, so we're just going to rename the columns. So what we've done, we've, we've read in our data, stored it as DF because we're using a data frame object. And we can use the columns attribute and rename this as a list of two strings, date, and we're going to call it amount. And if I display the data frame, we can see the difference here. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, I guess. Okay. So next thing we need to do is, as you can see, we can we can clearly read this date here, 
Um, and we can interpret what that means, but Python actually can't interpret what this means. And so we need to convert every entry in the date column to what's known as a date time object. And um, what this means is Python can interpret it and it you know, gives us access to a lot of built-in functionality within Pandas. And if you'll notice, it actually looks slightly different now. It looks subtly different. Still human readable, but now it's, uh, I'll say Python readable as well. So why are we using Pandas? Uh, first of all, it's a very useful skill to have, very uh, commonly used at industry. And that's because, as I said, it has lots of built-in uh, tools that you can use. Uh, and it's very useful, particularly for time series data. And as we see here, this is the standard way to read in some data. And we store it as a data frame. And each individual column we call a series objects. These are Pandas series objects. <clears throat> Now, just an, a word of advice when using Pandas, uh, often we need, often we don't have a clean data set, so we're going to have missing values uh, and whatnot. And so we often need to clean the data before we get started. Uh, so, for example, you'll have a, you may have a, a missing value here, and it's denoted with NAN, which stands for not a number. Uh, however, in this course, we're not really going to delve into how to uh, kind of sort through uh, and clean data. That's more on the data engineering side, um, but I would encourage you guys to look at that if that's what interests you. OK. And I'll just finally, one more thing we have to do on, on our data before we can start working with it. Um, so if you notice here, we have our date column, we have our amount column, but we actually have uh, these numbers here, which at this point is just labeling uh, kind of the row number but it's arbitrary and we don't need it and what we can do is set index to the date um, and this is essentially required for some of the things we're going to do later on uh, and it drops this arbitrary value here as well so if i do this now we can see that the date column has become the index uh, but we still retain the ability to access the date column at the same time um, and don't worry as to why the amount name has just floated up. I don't think that matters at all. So, has anyone had any problems with the notebook running so far, or are we good? I'll take that as everything's going perfectly. So, a common thing we, we want to do initially when we're working with time series is uh, visualize it. So, here using the matplotlib functionality, uh, we're just going to plot our data and give it some some labels and a title, and we can see that uh, straight off the bat, we can see there's clearly some kind of periodicity to this data, uh, and that makes sense given that you know it's going to have a clear link to what's going on in the world. So clearly, around Christmas time, perhaps the use of electricity might increase, uh, and during summer, where people um, aren't using heaters or whatnot, it might drop. So. That's one aspect of it. And secondly, we can see a clear upward trend. All right, and we'll see later on that we can uh, neatly kind of decompose this and analyze it further. Uh, so what I'm just going to do here is create a Boolean array which checks, which rolls over each column uh, and checks whether the date is within uh, 1995, 96 or 97. Uh, what's that, what that's going to allow me to do is plot the data over a smaller range uh, and we can inspect in more detail uh, this periodicity that we think we're seeing. And so here, as we expected, um, there are clear spikes and it follows sort of a fairly regular pattern as well. So clearly, if you are wanting to predict perhaps next month uh, when, sorry, how much electricity might be produced, um, this is a you know a powerful tool here because it follows a clear pattern. Okay. So the first kind of uh, process that we're going to look at uh, is rolling values. Uh, and so first of all, rolling average. So if we look at our data, it follows a general upward trend, um, and also it's jumping about, of course, because it will vary from month to month. 
But what if we were actually more interested in kind of the longer term trends? Um, and this is how we can kind of go about this. I've given an example here. Perhaps if we had a temperature data set which was sampled every hour, but we were actually more interested on what happens on a kind of week long time scale, then what we'd have is a smoothed out data set uh, and it would allow you to more clearly see uh, the kind of longer term trends. And so what we're going to do here <clears throat> is so we've created we have created um, a variable called amount, which is just the series from the data frame uh, corresponding to the amount column. OK. Um, a method that exists for this column uh, is called rolling. And in this case, I've indicated 12 here to denote a 12 uh, month rolling uh, object. And on that, we're using uh, the mean method. So this is going to output, uh, as you might expect, the 12 month rolling average for this data set. And so you can already predict you know, what that may look like. And we're just going to plot it here. Uh, and as you can see, this uh, much more much more clearly indicates uh, the long term trend of uh, of the data set. Uh, but you'll note you'll notice that we have a little a little bump here. And that's because if you think about what we're doing here, we're applying a 12 uh, kind of a window that's 12 items long. To the entire data set, but at the start, there's only going to be one, then two, then three and so on. Uh, items within that window. So that's why initially it is essentially just the same as the data because for our first kind of before we've slid our window, it only contains the first data point. And so once we've slid through 12 items, our window is now full and this is the, the mean over a 12 month period. OK. Uh, and similarly, Another rolling value that's uh, very important, particularly on a more financial side. So if you're examining stock market data, you might be interested in uh, the rolling standard deviation of a value as a function of time. Uh, and this is useful for identifying when uh, a variable is more volatile and more stable, since we can use standard deviation um, as a measure of volatility. I know other ones do exist, um, but this is quite a simple one. Uh, and so we can just draw more insights from our data by looking at periods when it's really jumping about versus periods when it seems to be quite stable. And so in a similar way, I'm going to create the variable rolling, the unfortunately named variable rolling STD. And in the same way as we did before, we do amount with the rolling method again with 12 as an argument. And then we use the dot STD method, which just uh, generates the standard deviation of the window at each point. Uh, and again, we can plot it. And so you may be led into thinking initially that over time, uh, the use of the production of electricity gets more volatile. Uh, but actually, another thing we can inspect by dividing our rolling standard deviation by our rolling average, we can access kind of a, a normalized standard deviation. And we see that actually, we don't really get much jumping around really, as much as uh, you may suspect from the left hand graph. So that's, a, that's quite a useful thing to look at. <clears throat> OK. OK, so uh, another useful tool that we can use is called resampling. Uh, and again, this is similar in the sense that you can use it to inspect longer term trends. Uh, but rather than a rolling window, what you do is you essentially treat your data as if it has a lower sampling frequency and you kind of group the, the points together. So for example, uh, again, with a financial example, let's say you have um, some metric on a stock, but you're interested in the quarterly values, um, given that you know uh, values for a quarter are quite relevant in finance. So 
you can use resampling for this um, and it'll give you kind of um, a more relevant estimate of whatever you're looking at. Yep, so as I've said here, similar similar kind of motivation for using it, but subtly different. Uh, and I've illustrated this with, a, with an example. So if we wanted to expect the total sales per week of a product, uh, but we had kind of the daily sales data, we wouldn't really want to use a sliding window here because you're not really interested in, um, oh, what did we sell from Tuesday until next Monday, right? You're interested in the Monday to interested in the Monday to Sunday windows. And so rather than sliding your window one day at a time, you slide it seven days at a time and you group those values together from which you can calculate uh, as before mean standard deviation and whatever function you like. But a commonly used one is mean uh, or sum in fact. And the, the sum is what we're using here. Okay. So if you missed anything I said, I've included some explanations on the Jupyter Notebook as well. So what we can do here, our data frame has a method called resample. And what we have to pass in as an argument is a string denoting uh, kind of the time scale that we want to resample on. So in our case, it's quarterly and conveniently we can use uh, just pass in Q. And then the dot sum method will give us the sum of all of these values um, on this kind of new frequency that we've you know, artificially created. <clears throat> so what we can see here, now, now we've got the, another data frame, we've produced another data frame, but you'll notice that it now has 133 rows rather than, I think it was 397. So clearly we've got some new data uh, and in fact, the amounts here are much higher than before. So we have 205, 170, 186. Uh, and if we look back at the old data frame, we had values of the order of 70, 60, 50, and so on. So we've, we've done some grouping together here. And it, and it seems that we've run into a problem here. So this is indeed the quarterly production of electricity in the US. Um, but does anyone think that actually was a massive drop in the final quarter? No, there wasn't. Um, so this is something to look out for because what we've done is we've resampled monthly data into quarterly data, but um, so we're grouping it into periods of three months, but we don't have a multiple of three columns. So what's actually happened is the final um, data point, the final resample data point only contains one <clears throat> only contains one data point. So it contains one month's worth of electricity production for what's meant to be and what is being compared to other three month periods. So we can get around this. I've just included a bit of maths in there for everybody. But uh, an easy way to get around this is using this uh, syntax here. And is anyone not familiar with uh, this syntax here? Are we all familiar? Okay, good. So simply omitting the final, uh, omitting the final element in these arrays or these series gives us uh, what we want to see without this artificial drop. Okay. And similarly, we might want to sample annually. So I'm not going to explain again what that will look like. We're now sampling over a 12 month period. Um, but rather than this 12 month rolling window, as I said, it's 12 month periods blocks together. And this time um, I've used the head function here because we only want to view the top of the data frame because we understand what's going on. But if I remove this, you can see we now have another different data frame, but again, much shorter than the one we started with. And again, we can plot this. But again, we have the similar problem, um, but I've already gone through a kind of how we can get around this. And luckily, you can emit the final value of the array again. And this is what we want to see. So another useful tool there, 
Um, and I didn't plan this for them both to have remainders of one, but it's it's lucky. If there if there was a remainder of three, for example, or four, you would omit the final four values and so on. Okay, and finally, I think I, I don't want to deviate too much from the slides. So finally, we're going to look at how to decompose our time series, uh, which is kind of what I touched on earlier, what I alluded to earlier. And this is where we really consider our, our time series to be composed of a few different things. So we, we uh, clearly we noticed some periodicity in the production of electricity. I'll just go back. So clearly there's some periodicity here. Uh, and it's season dependent, of course. So we call this seasonality. We also have a clear upward trend, which I don't think anyone's surprised about. And we call this the trend. Um, and finally, you know, inevitably in a data set like this, you're going to have uh, noise. So that's the final uh, component of our decomposition. So we, de we want to decompose our time series into a trend, seasonality, uh, and what's known as residuals, which is basically just noise. Sometimes you also see cyclical behavior. So in stock markets, people often think that they can predict um, like booms and periods where you don't want to invest on a much longer time scale. But this is kind of has a less exact definition than seasonality. And it doesn't have doesn't necessarily have to be constrained to a particular time scale. So it basically accounts for the fact that sometimes you know, external factors affect what's going to happen and it's not as predictable as we think. But it's worth noting, obviously some time series uh, are not going to have an upward trend or a downward trend. They might, uh, you know, level off, but they'll have some seasonality associated with them. And we will look at that as well, not in this lecture, but that's a property known as stationarity, where there's no upward trend or downward trend associated with our time series, but there are other components that we are interested in and we can look at. So the end goal really is to start with some raw data like this. This is not the data we're working with, but what we want to be able to do is, as I say, decompose it into this clear upward trend here, some clear seasonality here, uh, and again, some noise. Uh, and don't be alarmed by the shape of the noise uh, figure, just pay attention to the um, the axis label here. So it's actually relatively small. So there's no mistake here. Now, so the way, uh, a really easy way to perform uh, this decomposition is from statsmodels.tsa, standing for time series analysis, I guess, dot seasonal. Uh, and we use the seasonal decompose method, right? So there are two types of decomposition. Uh, we have additive, where we consider it to be our X being our time series, subscript T meaning it's time dependent, that's all it means. We consider it to be a sum of the trend, the seasonality and the residuals. Uh, but sometimes that might not fit what we're doing. And so we can also do a multiplicative decomposition, where we consider our time series to be uh, the product of these things. So in light of that, does anyone have a guess for what type of decomposition has been carried out here? At the back? That's correct. Why? As in, in the, in the raw data? Not quite, because that's a property of the data rather than the decomposition that we've performed on it. Um, but a way to tell is that uh, your noise should be, for a multiplicative, if you're, if you're multiplying something by a bit of noise, multiplying by one will give you the same thing back. So clearly, if the noise is centered on one, then we have, uh, this is a multiplicative decompose. If it was an additive decomposition, then this would be this would represent a linear offset of one, which means we haven't fully captured um, kind of what we can decompose it down into. 
Uh, and this will make more sense as you as we plot in the notebook uh, the two different types. <clears throat> so very simply, uh, as we've said here, helps if I display the notebook. So we first uh, import seasonal decompose. And first we're going to do the additive decomposition. So the way to use this is we create a decomposed result object. That's what gets returned when we use this function. And we apply it to our data frame. Um, and then we specify the parameter model uh, additive. So you can additively decompose or multiplicatively. And I believe there are other ways. And then we have three attributes which we're interested in and that is indeed the trend the seasonality and the residuals known as trend seasonal and resid uh, respectively and so we're just going to store those as variables and so hopefully if all has gone well i'm going to create a figure and we're going to see the raw data at the top and then hopefully the components that we wish to see so let's have a look and as if by magic, we have our raw data here. We have our trend. We have our seasonality, which indicates clear periodicity here. And we have our residuals. Now, here we have an additive decomposition. Uh, and this makes sense because our noise is centered on zero. And so there's no reason why the noise should not be centered on zero. If it's not, it means there's a linear offset that we've not captured. <clears throat> And that's the same for the same reason. If the multiplicative noise is not centered on one, then there's some linear factor of the trend or seasonality that we've not captured, right? And so very similarly, quickly brushing over that typo, we're going to look at multiplicative uh, decomposition. And so similarly, we create another decomposed result object which gets returned by seasonal decompose. We apply it to our data frame. And this time we use the model multiplicative. We now create, we've now created that object. And again, we can extract the three uh, features we're looking for. So trend, seasonality, and residuals. And as we expect, if we visualize this, we again see our raw data, uh, a general upward trend, and our seasonality here. But this time, interesting, our seasonality uh, again is centered on one, which makes sense uh, for reasons we said earlier. And this captures the oscillatory nature that we see here. Uh, and inspecting the seasonality in particular is uh, might be useful because if you really want to identify months in this case where production of electricity is at a low or high, it might be difficult to gather it from the raw data because of the noise present, because of the trend present. So this really allows us to just hone in on uh, one specific uh, aspect of the data that we're interested in. Uh, so what we can do quickly is just plot, just plot the seasonality. And we'll plot, we'll plot uh, over a much smaller range so i can just change the x limb here so let's say if i plot from in fact i'm going to show, change here the number of data points that we plot so we will plot uh two years let's say and same for seasonal Uh, so again, clearly, this is not the data. This is just the seasonality of the data, hence why it's oscillating uh, centered on one. And if I just change the X ticks, in fact, so we can view what's going on a bit better. I've got this right. Ah, oh, lovely. Cool. So we can really, we can identify here now from this, from this, seemingly noisy data set that we've looked at, we can clearly see 
So there's a big drop in electricity production uh, in April, a spike uh, around summertime, a drop uh, maybe just just before Halloween, I guess, and then possibly, as we all expected, a huge spike uh, around the festive period. Um, and so that kind of uh, gives you a taste of the sort of the usefulness and the power of decomposing our data into these three uh, components. Uh, and there are, you know, very many other use cases. Um, and yeah, so that's the end of the content for this lecture. But I hope that was a, a useful introduction. And I know that I may have whizzed through some of the pandas concepts. Um, so if anyone kind of has any questions afterwards, uh, we can discuss it over some pizza. But uh, thank you all for turning up and I hope that was useful and worth your time. So thank you very much. Right. Yeah, sure. OK, so uh, if you stick around for the coming lectures, we're going to look at uh, forecasting models, first of all. So that predictive power that I talked about. Uh, so, and, and then after that, we're going to try and incorporate some more stereotypical machine learning to that. So using deep learning, uh, LSTMs um, and kind of a work along project with some financial data. So that's what's to come, guys. Thank you. We'll stop there. <laughs> huh? Okay, so uh, there's some pizza. Uh, I'll just put it in the front. Uh, there's vegetarian options as well. So if you're vegetarian, just come and find me. Yeah. So. <laughs>